Good morning, Shoreline. We are on December 20th. We are five days away from Christmas. And I just wanted to, well, we could give you a warm welcome this morning. For those who are uh, our guests, my name is Gio Garces. This is my beautiful wife, Karen. And we serve in the Shoreline Ministry. Uh, we're excited about our live service today. We are live, and that's exciting. It uh, just gives us a little bit more of a connection uh, with you and I and uh, our family and your family. And we just wanted to continue these live services because they're just so important just for our connection. And after service, we're going to uh, break out into little, into little uh, breakout rooms, and we want you to have further connections, real live connections. So again, uh, welcome to our service. We're going to close out our series this morning, uh, Who Needs Christmas? And uh, it's going to be a closeout before we celebrate Christmas Day. I have an announcement for us, Al. Um, whoops, I think uh, maybe I did it wrong. No, I didn't. Yay. <laughs> I have Nicole Hogan that I wanted to welcome to our Shoreline Worship Service and to our ministry. Um, she has been a great friend through the years. She's actually been a disciple for 29 and a half years, and Woo -hoo. she's been in many ministries. And um, I love our friendship. She's very helpful, joyful. She mm -hmm. enters a room and she brings joy to the room. And she has helped me through the years just with different events that we've planned for our Shoreline Church that made them really fun. And um, I really appreciate having her back. Welcome, Nicole, for coming back. She also has a daughter, Rachel, who's 21 years old. And uh, she'll eventually, once she graduates from Pepperdine, will be back here in Shoreline as well. I wanted to give you a little bit about uh, information about Nicole in case you never met her before. Um, she graduated from USC with a master's in project management. Come on, girl. And right now, she's currently getting her doctorate in organizational change and oh, leadership. No. And so uh, she's definitely a hard worker. She's a loving mom and a great friend. Welcome, Nicole. Welcome, Nicole. It's great to have you. Let's go ahead and start with the prayer. God, thanks so much for this awesome Sunday morning to be together with the Shoreline Church. And we're so thankful for you. Thank you for saving us from our sins. Thank you for Christmas. Uh, God, thank you for our series just to focus a little bit about Christmas and what it means to every human soul. Not just us in Shoreline, but every soul that we have, we just pray, God, that you'll be with us this morning. Lift us up, build our spirits up, help our, our closeness with you grow, help our closeness with others grow. Pray for our, uh, our community, our county, the people around us. We pray for um, all the medical and first responders to uh, the, the pandemic, God. We pray for them, their hard work. we got a few members of our church that are you know, on the front lines there. And we're just so grateful for, for what they do for our community every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas, LaTroy. Well, Merry Christmas, Tina. And Merry Christmas, Chicago. All of you. All of you. Happy New Year as well. And Merry Christmas all around the world. Let's give Christ some praise. Here we go. You ready to sing?
message is time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christ is the message of Christmas. Ooh, uh, 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 not just a holiday. Christmas is every day. With Christ in your life. Heavenly Father, and his peace be on you all. Merry Christmas. Yo 
morning uh, everybody it's, thanks to be thanks for being here this is our uh, sermon for sunday this is the closing out of our third part of our series who needs christmas and we started out with answering that question is that the world needs christmas which is great because he came for the world and the second part was that god needed christmas god needed a demonstration 
to convince us that he loved us. And that demonstration was not just the birth of Jesus, but also his crucifixion and his resurrection. He needed something to demonstrate that someone was willing to die for someone else. And so we got that message. And, the, and those of us who are visiting this morning, we've responded to that message. This morning is our third installment of it. Who needs Christmas? We do. You and I do. We need it. And I want to look at the book of Matthew. It's one of the most Jewish gospels of all the gospels in your Bible. This is the most Jewish one because Matthew was writing to this Jewish audience. And he, and he really wants to explain and convince the Jewish community that Jesus was the one who the prophets had wrote about to save the world from their sins. And so in Matthew 18, or Matthew 1, verse 18, he starts out, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came. Now, that's a, that's a word that we in the English, we say Jesus. But in, in, in the biblical times, his name was Yeshua. There was no, there was no uh, letter J in the Hebrew. There was no letter J in the Greek. So they had this consonant sound that said Yeshua, which is another word for Joshua, which was a common name of Jewish boys living in that time. And in the uh, Greek, it's Yusus, and in the Latin, it's Yusus. And so eventually, that name becomes Jesus in the English. Uh, it, the, the J didn't come into the 1500s. Dr. J, he wasn't from Philadelphia. His name was Gian Giorgio Trissino, who invented the letter J, because there were some words that sounded like a J, and it was the I that sounded like a J. And so he made the he made the lowercase j with a dot, and he made that i with a little hook on it. And says, that's our English word now for Jesus. But in his time, it was Yeshua, which is an, which is an interesting uh, name that he was given because Yeshua, Joshua, is important. And he was also called the Messiah or the Christ, which in Hebrew or Greek just means anointed. His last name wasn't Christ. His name was Jesus, son of Joseph. But in the Bible, you're going to say Jesus Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the anointed one. So whether it's Greek or Hebrew, when you read that, it's really referring to Jesus as him being the chosen one, the anointed one of God that's come to save mankind from their sin. So whatever language you find that, that word in, in Greek or Hebrew, he is the anointed one. And it doesn't really matter for us. We just say Jesus, but in his biblical time, as we're going to take a look, it was it was an important name for the Jewish community because they had expectations. I'm going to show you just a little bit of the Hebrew and the Greek and how it came to be. Just so you have, I don't mean to ruin your Christmas on the J, but that was his name. That was his name in the Hebrew, Yahshua. Yahshua, God is salvation. Uh, in the Greek, there it is again. It, it, and these IE had the J sound, but there wasn't a letter J. Not until later on in the English that they started using the letter J that we use today and call him Jesus. So if you're a, if you're living in the uh, ancient Near East, it's Yeshua, it's Joshua, and so that name is 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 synonymous with 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 Jesus. It's 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 the same name, but it's important for the Jews because they remember the name Joshua. That was an important name for them. And so the names Joshua and Jesus are essentially the same. And both are the English pronunciations of both the Hebrew and the Greek names of our Lord. So fear not, you can still call him Jesus. That is his name. He'll respond to that. Just know that the Christ is not his last name. It's just that he is the anointed one. And here's what we're going to look at, at Matthew, his gospel. And he tells the account of Jesus. He tells the account of the, the chosen Messiah who has come. His mother Mary, Jesus' mother Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. They were, you know, they were legally bound. And this is a very intense situation. In previous generations, she'd be dead. In the first century Jewish community, they sent you away. 
outside the village, outside the community where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what they, 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 would, they would do. They would send her away. But years before, many centuries before, it was certain death for the woman. This was a huge deal because here is Joseph. Her, Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind, he's thinking about it, I'm just going to divorce her quietly. I'm not, I, I don't want there to be a big hubbub about the situation. I mean, this was a huge deal because Mary was a young woman. And here is Joseph showing and displaying grace in spite of humiliation. That's why later on the Jewish town that Jesus grew up in, they always refer to him, oh, that's Mary's son. That's Mary's son. Because they were like, yeah, there was something going on back there. We're not sure what happened there, but so-and-so. And so the Jewish people uh, of his community, when Jesus came back to visit, didn't believe he was the Messiah. He was, he was kind of born out of a scandal, in their opinion. But we know that the Holy Spirit gave birth to Jesus through Mary. And Joseph here is a man of deep character, deep integrity. Deep love for, for Mary, despite the scandal. And I mean, just this attitude. I mean, I can see why God chose Joseph to be the father of Jesus. I can see that. You know, he had such great character when the time came for a census to travel 100 miles to Bethlehem, his hometown, or just travel 25 to another city of Bethlehem nearby, a little village near Galilee. That was another one. But he comes down the 100-mile journey with the pregnant, his pregnant wife down to his hometown for the census. You know, when I did a census this year, I just it came in the mail. It was easy. Imagine traveling 100 miles to a census. I probably wouldn't have done it. But Joseph does it. He's amazing. And so there's a situation here. This was a big deal. This was huge. But yet Joseph shows grace. In humiliation, it's a calling for all the men to show grace when you feel offended. To, just, to show grace to those in our family, those we love. It's a huge deal. It's a great example for us men to look at Joseph and go, man, what a man of a great love and a great character. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So he was sleeping, and the angel came to him in his dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You see, in the, in the Greco-Roman world, even in the Jewish world, no one was expecting a virgin birth. Yeah, there were some writings in the Old Testament in Isaiah about, you know, the virgin having a child. But in the Greek culture, it was common for the gods to look at the beautiful women on earth and go and have sexual relationships with them and produce men like Hercules, produce men like uh, Achilles, to produce the Helen of Troy, who is the daughter of Zeus. It was common in the Greco-Roman world to think that way. In the Hebrew mind, they were expecting that Joseph would be an earthly father of the Messiah or Jesus would have an earthly father, a physical father that came from the line of David. They weren't expecting a virgin to give birth because they, they were expecting an earthly king that had an earthly father. And so this angel comes to Joseph and says, look, don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. Because what is in Mary is conceived by the Holy Spirit. The language there is the same language in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. When the Holy Spirit comes upon, uh, 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 upon those disciples who the apostles lay their hands on. The Holy Spirit comes on. It's the same language. It has no sexual connotation, which differentiates itself from the Greco-Roman world. And so we hear the story. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Yeshua, 
Yeshua, we say Jesus in the English. And this is exciting. This was exciting. If you heard that, uh, that, the, that the, the Jeshua was born, the Messiah was, was Joshua, you got excited. You're going, oh, the angel said to give him the Old Testament name of a warrior, of a deliverer. This could mean only one thing for the Jewish because hundreds of years of being a client state, hundreds of years of being a vassal state to, to Assyria, they had to bow to the knee to the king of Assyria. And Israel was a, was a vassal client state of Assyria for years. And then it was, they were the client state to the Babylonians. They were in captivity and they were in exile there. And then it was the Persians. After Alexander the Great defeated them, it became the Romans, the Greeks. And here they were. After finally, after hundreds and hundreds of years of operating as a client state to Assyria, to Babylon, to Persia, to Rome, having General Pompey come into our temple, we're going to gain our independence. Yeshua is born. Joshua, the deliverer, because he's going to save his people. Of course he is. He's Joshua. We read the stories. We heard the stories. Joshua went into the promised land where the giants lived. The sons of Anak, the descendants of the Nephilim lived. And they scared everyone, but they didn't scare Joshua. Joshua in Deuteronomy 2 and 3 goes into the land and defeats giants like King Og of Bashan. Exciting times. Yeshua was born, the anointed one. His name is Joshua. He's going to free us. He's going to save us from their oppressors. He's going to save us from the invaders. He's going to save us from Rome. The angel tells Joseph, he's going to save his people from their sins. And you're like, huh? The Jewish, God, the Jewish people are like, what? Wait, we, Rome has rulership again over us. We have Joshua. This is the moment the Messiah has come, the anointed one. Why, you know, Rome needs, he needs to defeat Rome. That's not really our need, our sins. That's not really our needs. I mean, we don't need, we don't need, a, we don't need our sins to be covered. Mr. Angel, you clearly aren't familiar Mr. Angel, you clearly are not familiar with the hierarchy of needs. You clearly are not. You're clearly not familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because, you know, physiological needs of protection, food, shelter. Physiological needs of survival, safety. I mean, there's a five-tier model, Mr. Angel, of human needs. The Jewish reaction was like, sin? Really? I mean, Mr. Angel, have you been paying attention? That's not really our pressing need. I mean, save us from sin isn't even on that list. See that, Mr. Angel? It's not even on that list. I mean, Mr. Angel, we have a difficult time feeding ourselves. And safety is a concern. The virus, Mr. Angel. Disease. A cut. An infection. The economy. Isolation, depression, loneliness. Come on, Mr. Angel. Now you're telling me I have to support a baby? Besides, besides, Mr. Angel, we already have an elaborate save you from sin system. It's called the temple. It's right over there. Take a look. The Old Testament covers almost every sin imaginable. I'll tell you who needs a saving, Mr. Mr. Angel. Rome needs a saving. Those guys need to be saved from their sin. We need saving from Rome. We need a savior with a sword. We have a way of already dealing with sin, Mr. Angel. We need to deal with the Roman Empire. We need a king who will save us. We need a Joshua kind, a Jericho, a Jericho kind of leader. We want Yeshua to be that leader. I mean, it's because sin isn't really our problem. Rome's sin is our problem. Compared to Rome, we're saints. Save them 
from their sin. Mr. Angel, it seems like you wasted a Savior. What we need is a Savior with a sword to deal with Rome and that crazy King Herod. We need that. But Joseph didn't respond that way. Joseph did what any of us would have done if an angel came to us and spoke to us directly. When Joseph woke up, he did what the You had someone interrupt your message. And so when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. You know, many of us sometimes, we don't feel like when we hear that Jesus came to save us from our sins, it doesn't feel like a felt need. Sometimes our marriage is more of a need. Or our singleness. Or algebra 2. Or chemistry. Our job environment. Sickness. The pandemic. Diabetes. My parents, addiction, your pressing need doesn't feel like it's sin. It's not your sin. It's her sin or his sin or it's their sin. I mean, we agree that, that sin is a problem, just not our sin. It's his sin. It's her sin. It's their sin. That's the problem. We need saving from the other guy's sin. That's why some of us, we're not moved when we hear that Jesus is sent to save us from our sin. Because the angel says this. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Here's what we hear. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will forgive his people of their sin. You see, we can reduce Christmas to forgiveness. And perhaps that's been your entire experience with God. Nobody's perfect. God forgives. But I'm here to tell you this morning, the message of Christmas is bigger than that and better than that. Because if Jesus and Christmas are only about forgiveness, you're missing the full message of Christmas. Because the angel said that give him the name Jesus because he will save his people he will save his people from their sins. That's what Paul picks up on. Jesus came to deliver from, to deliver us from. Like a warrior is going to, a warrior king is going to rescue us from the slavery of sin from the nation of sin, from the dominion of sin, the power of sin that lives in you. He came to save you from that. Why? Because sin kills. The depravity of sin. Look at our culture today. It's becoming more and more depraved. You know, the world was... Struggling with depravity in Genesis 6. God flooded the earth. The reason was, was because of the watchers, the sons of God, who came down 
and taught humanity depravity. And Jesus comes as Christmas to reverse that. If you want to learn a bit more about the sons of God and, and the watchers, go to our YouTube channel and I do a deeper teaching, a deeper dive into that on our 805 YouTube Shoreline channel to learn more about the Genesis 6 because we are living in those consequences. We are living in those times. And Paul picks up on this. He says, look, therefore, and he talks about sin, talks about, you know, Jesus dying for us and resurrecting and us getting baptized. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. I mean, so what's a choice? Yeah, Paul thought so. Paul thought it was a choice. It is a choice. He's arguing it's a choice. We choose. And he, goes, he also says, don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. The sin of selfishness is a huge problem in humanity. The lack of caring and the lack of compassion and the lack of love. The lack of being concerned for people spiritually around us. You know, we have lost souls around us every day. And they just cannot be abandoned. Our love has to connect with the lost souls of our world. And Paul says, look, don't offer yourself to sin. Don't be an instrument. You can decide this. You can stop this. But rather offer yourselves to God. He gives us an alternative, a different choice. We can choose to be an instrument of wickedness. Or we can offer ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And Paul is summarizing this. He's summarizing this. And he, and he echoes Genesis when he says, sin shall no longer be your master. That's what God told Cain after he killed his brother. Depravity. Sin will no longer be your master. Although it desires to have you, you must master it. So we can choose to live a life that offers ourselves to God as having been brought from death to life. Awesome. Because Paul tells us this, it's death, it's separation from God. You don't want to die separate from God. You don't want to die and go into the, the, the next world to the, to the afterlife where there, you don't see God. You're, you're removed from the presence of God because that's where, that's where sin leads you. That's where it takes you into the, into the next life where you don't see the presence of God. But Jesus was born to say, look, I'm here to give you the gift of eternal life. So when you pass away, when you die, when you go into the next life, you're going to be in the presence of God. Christmas is so powerful because he came to save us from our sins. Yeah, forgiveness is included, but he came to save us from our sins. Not just forgive us. Like, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm just going to keep sinning. Oh, well, no. He came to rescue us from that. He came to save us from that. Because Jesus and Paul and God are all saying the same thing. You know, whether Jesus says, leave your life of sin. Whether God tells Cain, you know, sin is crouching at your door. You have to master it. Paul is saying, look, sin is not your master. Maybe that's all you need to hear this morning. That sin is not your master. Through Jesus, through Yeshua, you can have a new master. Not the law of God, but the Spirit of God in you. The Holy Spirit in you. Maybe it's time to move past the forgiveness-only religion. Maybe it's the reason Jesus came. It's the real reason Jesus came is to save us from sin because he broke the power of sin. He lived a life without sin. He offered his sinless life to those who would receive it. Christmas. So if you're a Christian or if you're a disciple whose religious experience is just an endless cycle of trying and failing and forgiveness, Maybe you just need to be told 
that sin is not your master. Jesus is your savior. He came to save you from sin. You know, I remember uh, as when I first became a disciple, sin was my master. And there are remnants of my sin in my character even to this day. The sin of selfishness, the sin of anger, it's there, the remnants. I have to wake up and decide it's not my master. Yeah, there's ways I was raised that give me a propensity to have certain emotional dispositions. Yeah, that's real. But sin is not my master. Yeah, does it make me insecure as a, as a man at times? Yeah, but that's pride. Sin is not my master. You see, we all have to live with, live with that. But maybe you need to hear the words of God and Jesus and Paul. That sin is not your master. So Matthew closes us out by saying, look, who needs Christmas? All who need to be saved from their sins, that's us. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We need Christmas. We are thankful for Christmas. We're thankful that Jesus, Yeshua, the warrior king, came to rescue us from the nation of sin, from the dominion of sin, and from our sinful natures. He came to rescue us and reverse the curse of sin in our lives. Let's pray for our communion. God, we are so thankful and grateful for you that you came to save us from our sins. I know it's so tempting to look, ever, look around the room Look around our family room and say, are you saving me from, save them from their sin. No, you came to save us from our sin, our personal sin. And the more, God, we can be in touch with that, the more our gratitude will grow. And the more we need to hear that sin is not our master, it will encourage us to decide to offer ourselves to you. Because you are the best alternative, God, to sin. You are the best way to free us from the life of sin. And so we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for the birth of Jesus. We thank you for the angel talking to Joseph. We thank you for Joseph having the character to obey what the angel said. And we're so grateful to celebrate with our families in this chaotic year of 2020, the craziest year ever, that you would save us from our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so it continued both day and night. Noel, 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 born is the King of Israel. King of Israel, Noel, 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 born is the King of morning. Uh, I know we had a little bit of a challenge with the sermon for a few minutes. Hopefully you got the gist of why Jesus came and the saving of us. And so the connection there. And um, we're at the time now where we're, we're, we're thinking about our offering and we want to close out our year in a good spiritual platform of giving and honoring. Um, hopefully you guys are on a good, have a good Christmas budget for your spending there. This is a dangerous time uh, with all the easy online access to spending uh, loads and loads. But we just want to encourage you to remember God, remember your giving. It makes a difference in our church. It makes a difference in the lives in our community. So with that, let's bow our heads and more word of prayer. God, thank you so much for the ability to give, our hearts to give, to honor you, honor you first, give you the glory, give you the praise. You deserve it. Thank you for saving us from our sins. Thank you for continually reminding us, God, that we're not slaves to sin. And God, help us to uh, be joyful, be grateful, and to give joyfully and cheerfully. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're about to head into our breakout rooms. Um, and you can always get our service on YouTube, 805 Shoreline uh, church and, and see all the, everything we, 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 that we've done from deeper teaching to the Sunday services Those are really great stuff. Um, we're going to go in our breakout rooms right now. And I just want to encourage you to talk about, um, yourself.